really early for me. I'm just back from the holiday in Dragon Eye, which means I have a one hour jet lag. Um, then I will really late fly it, so bear with me for a couple of moments. But I'm just about that. Um, as you can see, there's little hair left on my head, so I'm one of the old people in the open source community. Um, when I started in 90, 96, I started out as a web developer doing PHP, no, back then Perl actually. Um, and I evolved into at some point being the person who knew how to write a machine, and that was when I became an ops person. Um, so I've been, I'm going to try to move to the middle because I think I'm otherwise going to hide behind the curtain. <laughs> so I'm somewhere between building things, keeping things alive, and making them evolve. Um, I've been organizing open source conferences for, uh, well, the better part of the last two decades. Um, I started DevOps Days together with Patrick. I started Config Management Camp together with Tushar. Um, so, my day to day job today is that I'm um, doing most of the engineering work that Oli does. Oli is an open source spin off of Inuits. Inuits is one of the larger open source consultancies in the Benelux. Um, we're about 150 people spread over a bunch of countries. Um, most people curse at me on Twitter or Mastodon or whatever when they run into the fact that they run once again into a DNS problem. Because the title of my blog for the last two decades has been everything's a fucking DNS problem. <laughs> so who does not have DNS problems? <laughs> Wait, this is weird. <laughs> People with no DNS problems. You You're new to computers, right? I use the host file. You use the host file. Yeah, that's <laughs> not it. We'll come back to that later in this talk. <laughs> Good one. So yeah, um, this is what we do. Mostly focusing on information these days. I want to talk to you about this DevOps part. Um, maybe it's a little too early to ask you folks how to define it. We had a DevOps days in Good work. Hmm. We're here to 2024, so I think it was 2011, ages ago. Um, and that was the, the third event we had worldwide. The second one was in Hamburg, the first one was in Ghent, where we started it. And it was basically started because Patrick and I had a stupid idea to bring Sydney of our best friends to Ghent to talk about our experiences doing open source stuff, because we've been doing open source for a better part of a decade before about how we were learning to use the, the new thing back then, which was the cloud, uh, both on-prem and public, and building private and public cloud infrastructure, and also how to deal with AR software development. And at the crossroads of those three ideas, we figured out that there was a lot to learn from each other. So we hosted this really small conference, and we didn't really have a name for it, but we got the idea. And then at Velocity, same here, John Oswald and Paul Hammond gave a talk, DevOps, 10 deploys the way Flickr, and that's how we got to the name. And since then, everybody's been abusing that name, because now we have things like DevOps in place. So let me give you my definition about DevOps. It's basically a global movement to improve the quality of software delivery, leveraging open source experience, which we saw in 2009. And really, open source part to me is crucial. Um, I would never start anything that had to do with proprietary software. So if anybody tells you that DevOps never was meant to be open source as an idea, as a movement, as a conference, they're playing wrong because it wouldn't exist if it wasn't for me. So, why do I talk about DevOps? Because one of the key components is that we talk about automation, that we talk about how to foster deliver software. And part of that is infrastructure as code. It's automation. So I'm going to look back at what I learned over the past, well, infrastructure is good automation, probably somewhere starting when I did it in 2005, no, 6, so that's probably the past two decades. And we study history because of all those reasons. And really, all of them, because I have a the old burned out person, my burned out twice, crashed twice. Um, but I have experience, I know how to do things, I know what works, I know what failed for me. And I think a lot of the things I learned are things you might learn from too. Does that mean you need to literally do what I say? No, but this talk is going to be about patterns, it's going to be about 
what I've seen in the wild, some good, some bad. And you can cherry pick the good ideas you want from that. And that's probably the only time I want you to cherry pick things. Just face it. This industry, we're running in circles. If you've been around for a while, you see that the things we faced 10 years ago, we're breaking them again. And unless we stop doing that, we're going to keep running in circles. And yes, even like this girl here who went to Bed of Days Amsterdam, I think in 2013, got a t-shirt, she's also running in circles. <coughs> so where do we come from? Back from our still here, we were installing a machine by taking a CD on which we burned an ISO image, we put it inside a server, we went to the data center and we started clicking, okay, okay, next, next, next. Because that's what the Slack were, Fedora, and I cannot the Slack were. Early Red Hat editions, at the end, that's what they were doing. Next, 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 next. And then we figured out that worked for one server, two servers, but suddenly we got our actual machines. And that didn't work anymore. So we need to figure out the way to speed up. And then we had things like Mondo Rescue, where we did an installation once. We took a clone of that installation, and then we created a new CD, which did literally the same installation. But mine is the click, 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 click. So we improved. And then we went to, well, there's changes in here. So we did things like System Manager, where we put multicasting over the network, and where we could define different deltas between the different nodes, like network, and the host file. Okay, he's already asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so we moved, and we started figuring out, well, this doesn't work, we need to grow, we need to have just another operating system, and then do some kind of configuration management. And then things started evolving. We got things like Steve Engine. I mean, Steve Engine just celebrated their 30th anniversary. We still haven't fixed this problem. And we've got new tools like Puppet and Chef and Ansible, and then Docker came along, and then Terraform, and Cube, and Lumi, and OpenTofu. And we're still trying to figure this out. 20 years ago, we had one Snowflake server, then we started doing clustering, then we started doing virtualization, then we started doing cloud, and then we started doing containers. And the scale of things grew. But the amount of people we had to do things didn't really grow. So the problems we ran into were, well, manual failure. If you do something once, you know, something twice, the third time a human does something, it's going to be boring, it's going to look aside and say, oh, well, you're going to make mistakes. People started logging onto machines, or people still log onto machines and make changes. And we ended up with infrastructures that were completely not reproducible, that were completely not scalable, and humans making mistakes. So one of the first problems we ran into was Config Drift. And this is what Config Drift looks like. So you've got three different environments. You've got a development environment where you build something that looks like it should. Then you've got an acceptance environment and somebody makes some small changes. Put some little bricks left and right. And then production, well that doesn't even look anymore like what the development environment looked like. It's still a bit the same shape but it's completely different. And this is what most organizations that don't have their infrastructure under control look like. The environment should look identical, but they're actually completely different. And the behavior of those applications running there is going to be different. So, the imaging ID, that was good, right? I mean, we've got some manually really well done piece of art, a really well crafted snowflake, and then we copy that. And then we copy that again. And then somebody modifies that again. And then modifies that again. And at some point you're like, where does this come from? How do I build this? How about security? Did somebody patch this? Or... And a lot of the proprietary vendors out there really made people shine in this kind of work. Let's all clone VMware images, right? Let's all clone Amazon images. 
What some of you who built this? An operational iceberg. So 15 years later, the circle was round and people who didn't understand that we need to fix infrastructure so came up with this idea. We took some random image from the internet, at some random point we did an update, then we installed a package, and then we got some undefined code from somewhere. What's really wrong with this image? You forgot to see it to the directory. Yeah. Sorry? <laughs> oh yeah, you forgot to see it to the directory. <laughs> <laughs> That's one part of it being wrong. The part which is really wrong is that every time you run this, you're going to get something different. There's no way to predict what you're going to get when. There's ways around that, but still. So that's why we really need to think about infrastructure as real code and not this kind of basic stuff out here. And we need to look at our infrastructure and treat it with real code. We need to take development practices into the way we build infrastructure. So we need to use version control, we need to have pipelines, we need to have tests, and all that in there. And when we talk about infrastructure, to me, that's not just the machines, the network, the rack, it's everything. It's everything you need to run your software. So that means from all the way down to the network, all the way up to the middleware that you depend on, container stack if you need it, your straight VMs, but everything in between. And lots of people only focus on the really small part. I mean, you really want to be able to survive the 10-4 test. Who knows what the 10-4 test is? Lots of questions for the client of the morning, right? So the 10-4 test is the idea that you can take any piece of hardware in your infrastructure, throw it out of the 10-4 building, and either you don't even notice, or you should keep running again in a couple of minutes. And most organizations are not capable to do that. And that's, at least for me, the basic reason why we want to do circuits code. One of the things is, you never deploy once. You start working on something locally, and you abort it for a while, then you need to spin up the development environment, and eventually you want to go to production, or you need to share it with a colleague, so you need to be able to give that colleague exactly the same ecosystem that, was, that you were working on. You need some development environments, you need some clustering, you need to have some disaster recovery. So the argument that you're never going to need more than one environment, that's what. You need to be able to re-spin something and make sure you can reproduce it. Looking at today's world, I think you need three types of tools to run the infrastructure. To do that model. One tool you need is something to do provisioning. Spin me up an instance of such and such application, spin me up a container, spin me up a VM, be a public cloud, can be private. Make sure it's there. And the second thing is that you need to make sure that something is still there. You want to be able to define the desired state. On a web server, you want to be able to say, hey, it needs to be Nginx running on this port with this SSL certificate. And if that changes, make sure it's back up and running. Things like chat, but it's all data that. And then there's the orchestration part. It's to be able to instruct your infrastructure ad hoc to do something. Like upgrade these, these, and these packages on all the alt nodes or on all the even nodes, if you want to do something like shadow deployments. Um, trigger this action on these services, do rolling upgrades, things that you do or you tell a certain group of service to do right now. Right, let's do this one. And if you're doing infrastructure as code, you want to have some kind of single source of truth which ideally you get by the results of applying your code base and which you can then later use to configure other parts in your infrastructure. Like I've spun a container which has a web server in there and it needs to be monitored, it needs to be up and running, and I want to have five instances from this. And at some point you start with zero, and at some point you have five, but if you want to be sure that the five parts are there and that your monitoring actually checks those five, 
or if it's gone, that you want to forget. If there are six parts, your loads bounce will need to be reconfigured if there's only six. If you add a node, remove a node, those things need to be updated. So yeah, a couple of goals, a couple of things you want to have in your infrastructure. Can containers solve all this? Mm -hmm. Sometimes they solve a lot of things, but where do you deploy your containers? You need to be able to provision the infrastructure where you deploy your containers on. You need infrastructure as code to do that, to define what your Kubernetes cluster looks like, to define the storage ecosystem below that. Do you put everything in containers? Well, I hope you don't. Unless you really don't want to have data. What about their configuration? How they behave? How they use? I'm a really big fan of the 11 and a half factor concept. Why 11 and a half? Because there's one big mistake in the 12 factor, which is export environment equals. Because that is really hard. Because if I do export environment equals and I run a service, I stop it and somebody else has another export. I get a completely different behavior on the same node, which is absolutely close to undetectable. If this is coming from an automated platform, sure. But the way they describe it, it's harmful. So that's a lot of background. What do we really want to look at? If you start doing an application, if you want it to be deployed, there's a number of questions you really want to ask. And maybe the first one is, do you want to reproduce the infrastructure? Or is this just something that's going to run once and be thrown away next Monday? Do you want to reduce manual error? Or do you just want to create more jobs? Maybe you just want to create more jobs. Do you want to achieve desired state? Or do you want to be your ecosystem in different states of whatever? And do you really want to have monitoring or backups? Do you want to have security? Or do you want to have some nodes that are secure, but some you forgot to firewall because you're doing everything manual? I mean, take these questions, get the answers that work for your organization, and then figure out where you want to do. So let's look at a number of the patterns that I Look at that. And while a bunch of these patterns are focused on infrastructure as code, you'll notice they'll actually be for time of every single code you, you know. The first one is it works for my own directory, it works for my machine. I've been hacking on some Ansible code, I run my playbooks locally, and things <coughs> hack. It doesn't really scale. I mean, once you have a colleague who wants to make some changes, you're in trouble. So it really doesn't promote collaboration. It doesn't really... It's good for a single systems person. It's good for a single developer. But that's not what reality is like. Slight improvement on this is it's in Git now. Still in your own directory. But it's version controlled. <laughs> and you'd be surprised even the last two, three years, how many times we need to teach people to put stuff in version control. So that's the story, but it is. So, the next pattern I've run into is we've just automated the operating system. Maybe some basic services like SSH or something, but we don't really collaborate with the people that actually deploy the application, we don't really manage the application, there's other tools that do that. So what you end up is having an ecosystem where you see small parts of what you want to know being monitored. So you don't really get monitoring or security implemented. It's like, yeah, you got some basics. And typically this is when silos are really big in an organization and the application team doesn't talk to the storage team, doesn't talk to the network team, and it's really siloed people. 
What's better, obviously, is people who say we do everything. We've all made everything. We can provision things. Oh, that's good. So this is not a charger. Um, there is a charger. Yeah, there is a charger, but I mean, one USB-C port, and that's for the audio now. Um, so if somebody has an old-school Dell power plug, that would be handy. Or if we can figure out a way to go from another HDMI plug to this one, that would also be. Because I, I kind of assumed that this was power, but it isn't. We still got 23 minutes. <laughs> USB-C won't work because USB-C is already the HDMI output. Unless the USB-C also has power, that would be good. Which was a mistake I made. Yeah, computers in 2025. We think we move forward, but... <laughs> we use one single connection for everything, we're going to have failure right now. Anyhow, so people provision all the things. All the all the things. Uh -huh. That's a good one. Another pattern we run into is a pattern where you do package configuration services. Like every simple application you run into, there's some artifact you need to build that needs to be deployed. That's a package where it has an RPM and that in package or even container image, it's a package. You need to add some configuration to it, like you are the 15th instance of this service and you need to talk to these data backends. That's where your storage is. And when you know about that, you can actually run what you need to be able to run. And that's the basis. You have package configuration and service. And then next to that, people figure out, well, there's more to just the package configuration of the service. That's good locally, but we also have a number of the non-functional requirements. We want to tell a monitoring service like, hey, I'm the service which listens on these ports, and if you look at this endpoint, you can figure out if I'm healthy. Or, here's a data set that I want you to back up. Or, it's not only about being healthy, but at this end point you actually have a bunch of metrics. And a lot of these things, if you look at 15 years ago, people were absolutely not implementing. These days, and that is one of the advantages we got from things like you, is that those health endpoints and those things have kind of been standardized. Because in order to get things deployed, sometimes you really need them. So non-functional requirements slowly start to become more relevant. I mean, if there's any power outlets around here, that would be handy, but I don't see any. Unless I can unplug... But they did have HDMI on the laptop. Yeah, but I have, I have three more HDMI too. Well, you could do the switch. That's right, because I need it. Uh, yeah, but if we do use the power, then there was nothing there. Just just regular working to your You can, yeah, yeah, that, that's okay. That works. Yeah. That device is just nothing. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I can play. Yeah, we got that. Okay. Okay. We're good. Yeah, it's power. So then we got people who figured out they got PCS, they got non-factual requirements, and you can pretty much bring up a stack all out of the and then you see a bunch of different parts. Like the blue part is the thing that's really defining what does your stack look like, what does your application look like. And I can spin up multiple instances of those. The green parts are things where you say, hey, I have this code base, but depending on the configuration I get this code base, it's going to be disaster recovery side, it's going to be a lab environment, it's going to be production, or it's going to be shadow production. And then the red part is the actual customer data. And the parts on the red, on the on the right, sorry, you can have multiple instances of this. They can change in size. They can vary a lot of different things. But looking at the infrastructure as code part, the blue part is something that's in version control, where you can actually release an artifact and say, hey, this is the version of the infrastructure that's running. That's how we need code sort. The green part is the configuration data. 
that's also somewhere in version control. So if you want to get cheap disaster recovery, the only thing you need to do back yourself is the red part. The rest you can regenerate, rebuild from source codes. So that's a really good idea to get started with. So let's look at some other patterns. We're a large enterprise organization and we have multiple tools. The ops people actually use Chef to configure a bunch of things, but the Java developers have figured out they have a good, new, cool templating tool and they're really going to configure everything on the fly. Oh, and they're going to restart the service every five times they actually change the configuration. So now we rerun things every, and it's rebooting and it's restarting. And the ops folks are like, why is this thing unstable? We only change and we only reload when we deploy these things. But the Java tool rewrites the XML with exactly the same parameters, but in a different order. Actually, Ruby does that because it didn't sort back in the days. Or another one is we've defined our whole Google or Amazon or Azure infrastructure in code but then somebody goes to UI and changes parameters. Fun. <coughs> so we got people working locally, we got people putting stuff in Git, and we have people who test their codes, who use things like local site to test their EC, to test their EC2 codes. And then we've got setups where the only way that something can change in production is by one specific user which is not a human, it's pulling things from the source control repository and then running tests and then applying things. Does that sound smart to you folks? Who's doing that? One hand and then <laughs> one hand maybe. I use fossil. I use fossil. You use what? I use fossil instead of gig. Okay, you use a different version of the old tool. Okay. Fair enough. <coughs> so, here's a pattern we sadly run into way too many times. We use this tool, we build all this automation, we build all this code, and we run it once and then we haven't touched it for six months. Because somebody figured out they needed to make local changes because something happened in production, and yeah, now it's you don't really dare to make changes anymore. So, yeah. Uh, yeah we also don't do security updates, because who does, right? So people fight over code. People don't really collaborate. That's the problem. Typically this happens with tools who are really, really good in orchestration, not in ensuring desired state. A lot of cases where you see this is when some external party comes in, some consultant says, yeah, we need to spin up these, these and these services, and it needs to go quick, they have automated everything. They run their, I was about to say asshole playbooks, but let's say they run their old code. They run it once, and then they disappear. Okay, I think it's mostly asshole folks who do that. <laughs> so it's YOLO integration mode, and it's fast, it's a quick win, but it's not really solving things. So, the other one is, we've been having this reporting on our infrastructure's code tool, and yeah, it's been broken for ages. Like, if we try to apply this set of YAMLs, it's gonna break. But, it doesn't really make any changes, so we run anyhow. Or we, we've disabled this, because well, it's production, we shouldn't be touching this, right? We, it's running. As long as we don't make changes, it's running. Until you really need to make those critical changes because there is a security issue that you need to patch right now. So, the opposite of that is we enforce this every two hours we make sure that it is in the state we want it. We actively fix and monitor things. And if something isn't the point we wait, it is a critical issue that we need to fix. And there's reporting on that, and we make sure that there is no drift from where we want to be. Which means we have achieved desired state. 
We know what the infrastructure looks like. We know what applications are running where. We know which application depends on what. And we know. A slightly variant of that is, it worked for a while, then something broke. Something else broke. And the security folks came in and said, no, stop doing this because you can't break more. And we don't have control over this. And now we're doing some manual changes. But we actually see what's going wrong. And we, we know that. We kind of have desired state. Partially. And the thing is, the security folks actually should be pushing to full desired state because that is what they look like. That is what, what, that is what they should look for. They should look at small changes in infrastructure and figure out where there's something that should be the way it is. But sometimes they're afraid of those changes. We have a pipeline. We actually have source control that checks out things, tests it, validates, deploys to one environment, and then people can promote it. And it's fast, it takes a couple of seconds, while the testing takes a minute and a half. What's scary about this slide? Maybe the font is too small. See so people in the back mulling, it's too small. Or it's This is a pipeline dating from September 2012. <laughs> doing infrastructure, doing GitOps in 2012, and it's still being used in production. <laughs> well, not this code base, but other code bases here. <coughs> and that is the way the idea of, of, of GitOps, like you have something in code, it's being deployed. And it ends up defining infrastructure in a sense, in a state. So let's talk about environments. To me, an environment is a logically split up set of service or services that together group a service. Like I've got a development environment, I've got a lab environment, I've got multiple production environments. And it's the same code base but it has a different identity. And one of the really good benefits is if you have promotion stages in a pipeline, you can write all the bugs you want because they're only going to be deployed to the first target. You're going to limit your blast status and it's only going to break that first development platform or maybe two development platforms. You're going to be able to learn from the mistakes you make. You can introduce things like feature flagging, like only do this on these, these environments, do this on the environments with these functions enabled, and you can promote sets of features. I mean, this is just like regular software development. So it's always the same code, but with a different configuration per environment at a different point in time. Because at the moment that your active development of the platform stops, it's going to be the same commit. The new things are going to be a bit bad. If you don't do this, if you have like this one big environment, you make this win one small potential breaking change and it's going to bring everything down. Patterns you see there is where people actually have code that looks like role for this application for development, role for this application for acceptance, role for this application for production. And they start to, and this is what you should be doing, cherry-picking the changes from the different code bases. It's also really hard to have different parameters in code, and in, in configuration. If you don't have environments, it's going to be spaghetti code, which is if, then, this, else, whatever. If you have different environments, you're going to have a data set which defines your code base. You're going to have multiple environments easy next to each other. Somebody once said, I think it was charity majors, everybody has a test department. Some people are just lucky it's not a production environment. But in a way, that is what a lot of people do. We just run things, we don't really test. And you can discuss the value of testing on your infrastructure. But to me, the minimum thing in testing is that you monitor your development environments. If you deploy code that breaks, 
your monitoring should detect it. And that's already a good start. Security. All of our config, all of our secrets are in the code. The amount of times you run into ecosystems that have that, like, yeah, we want to share you our code, but we cannot really give you access to Git because all the passwords are in there. Or, well, also all the passwords from the five past years which are recycled are in there. But well, you could also see that the last bit came in is three years ago, so we haven't changed our passwords for three years. And they're human readable, and they're on everybody's laptop check out. This is not an infrastructure code problem, this is a general industry problem. The opposite of that, obviously, is we have secrets, they're stored in a secure store, our code loops are the credentials, as a key that can access it, humans cannot read it, and they're only in memory and almost never on disk. Which one do you want? So when you do much of those things, you really have a single source of truth. You do some code that's periodically running into the reporting bag, it stores its information centrally, you can query that and you can reconfigure things on the fly, real time or periodically, depending on what you want, you get a full life cycle. And when you decommission something, it automatically removes those rules, removes those load balancer rules, removes those authentication rules. We've been doing this for ages. Something that actually exports its knowledge, stores in the database, different sources collect it. So this is, for example, an application web server, and that's load balancer, that's firewalling. It's ancient, but Cube does it these days. Um, all the other things do it these days. The other thing, the alternative is, well, I have seen this way too much in the old, like, we've got an Asmo playbook that actually commits changes to a configuration review, <coughs> and it's kind of automated, but then humans modify this code also, and it actually breaks the monitoring content. Not what you want. We haven't brought in management yet, right? What do you think management wants to do when they do infrastructure? They want you to use a user interface and click around. They want you to blueprint something which is, hey, we're going to build a website, and every website, web application from now, is going to be a database, and you're only going to have Postgres version 7, you're going to have Nginx, and all of you are going to need Varnish. <laughs> and that's the pattern you can deploy. If you want something else, too bad. What do you mean Postgres version 7 is ancient? Yeah, that's what we have. But we get you a really nice UI on top of this, and you can click, and it's going to get you there instantly. Lots of large enterprises doing proprietary software are getting a lot of money on that, and nobody who's doing actual operations wants to use it. Because they figured out that actually starting this in a, what's your version control tool again? That doesn't matter. You started in version control? You started in Git? Wait, wait. Yeah, I was thinking you were. Because you were the one not using Git. That's yeah. Cool. yeah. <laughs> so you use that one or Git or whatever. Um, and you write to go to do it. So yeah. Suddenly another one we really run into is that people forget, well, people forget, honestly, I don't know any decent infrastructure to go to that is not open source. Um, wait, maybe I shouldn't say that today. There are forms? Yeah. Um, you said there are forms, right? Yes. Okay. I've been saying tofu all morning, but yeah. That didn't start out as an open source project, let me put it that way. Um, but a lot of the communities around this have built a lot of code to deploy and to manage certain tools. Some of them done it really good, some of them done it really bad. Um, 
looking at the mountain community, and every time I look at mixins and that kind of stuff, I'm still still doesn't work. So we do chase on it and gamble, and I'm lost. But mostly people forget to look at what's upstream and start writing everything in Hasga. What do you mean there's 20 modules on GitHub that do Apache? Mature communities actually have communities within a community that maintain code bases. Like if you look at Fox Bookly, which is a still today really active community that manages a huge part of code, code base. They have tests built in, they have everything you want to make sure that if you want to deploy Apache, use that module. It has everything in there. But no, people just write the thing from scratch and figure out that they spent way more time building things from scratch than what they actually need. But it depends on the maturity of the community. In the community, there is something you can help. You can send patches, you can come through back, like any other open source project. So use those upstream modules, use that code base out there. And then there's another pattern. Who loves branching? I see people shaking their heads. So I see one hand. So, if we're talking about an open source project where you have external people contributing to your code base, branching and sending pull requests is a natural way of doing things. If you're talking about running a software as a service platform, running an infrastructure, branching is an absolute anti pattern. Because it means that you need people to review the code, which means you need people who you should be trusting that you don't trust, which means you have not sufficient code base. It means that you're doing cherry picking. It means you haven't understood the basics of continuous delivery or continuous integration, which means strong based development and everybody merges their code into the main truck on the least of daily days. And yes, you can talk about short lived and long lived branches, but once you start talking enterprise, my definition of short lived is by the time I close my laptop, is the branches are gone, and the enterprise variant of short lived is see you in three months. So, yeah, let's not have that discussion. What you get, and a lot of the early GitOps, GitOps in the terminology of we're doing Cube and we have a bunch of YAML files to get all to deploy it, have this problem, and I still see it around, is they have a branch for platform X, a branch for platform Y, a branch for every single environment they have, and what did they just create again? They created config. <coughs> the very problem we try to fix with these tools. So, please don't do that in your own infrastructure unless you want to shoot yourself in the foot. So yeah, this was about open source. Because most of the tools we know start out with open source. And a lot of really big communities have grown around these tools. But sometimes these communities get betrayed. I mean, a lot of tools started out and saying, hey, we've got this tool, this part is going to be always open source. This one is our commercial part. Which is, I mean, not my favorite, I prefer full open source, but I can accept it. But then sometimes our communities get betrayed. And definitely in, in this kind of ecosystems, I mean, if you look at what happened to Elastic and Mongo and all of those tools, which were data stores, there wasn't that much active community contributions from upfront already within the tools, let alone external tooling that used it. But if you look at infrastructure's code tools, sometimes the code base that uses those engines is bigger than the tool itself. So the community is not really into writing and building the tool and making the changes, but it's in the code that actually uses the tool. And if then something happens, if then somebody decides to go all vulture capitalist and say, hey, we're going to change licenses, then we have a problem. And that is why I had to trade back and say, well, <laughs> almost everything is open source. 
I'm not using Terraform anymore. I switched to Tofu when it was released. And you should probably too. Because if as open source community we do not stand up against the vultures that actually take our hard work and steal it under our foot, we're going to have more and more of this kind of problems. And it's not something we want to return, just a community like this. And with that closing note, there was a bunch of things I learned. Some people say we're doing infrastructure as code because they're using the tools, but they're not actually getting any of the benefits from using these tools. And some people are actually really benefiting from using the tools. I've shown a number of patterns that you can pick from, that you can choose from. I guess you know which ones I prefer. But you're free to do whatever you want. But do one thing. Stop clicking around. Don't go to the user interfaces and create a new VM or create a new container. And when somebody says, hey, here's the user interface you need to use to deploy this, maybe that's not what you want. And if you're an application developer, maybe look at how can my application be configured from a config file or from an API rather than from a user interface. Thank you. You like you play the like automation, but you also mentioned that we've been running around in circles, and that one motivation in software development could be to create more jobs. So I'm curious: Do you think if our main motivation were in fact just to create jobs, not to do anything useful, would we wind up with precisely the industry that we have today? <laughs> we've been adding layers and layers and layers of complexity. Um, yeah, that's what the industry is doing right now. Um, speaking from experience, I had a team five, six years ago. We were managing with four people, about 25 different application stacks, about 1,500 nodes. And it was already smooth. I mean, people wanted to be on call because there was no downtime, things were stable, things were running smooth. And then containers came, and now we have three times the size of the team with lesser applications being managed. So yes, <laughs> and we're back to different silos. But we call it platform engineering now, so it's fine. But yeah, we've been making things more complex than they should be, and we really should go back to, or back, well, not back, we really should go to a, a state where you're not being looked at like what you're not using to remit is. No, I'm not, because I don't need it. And you probably don't need it too. But if you now say that I'm not using Q, you, you look like, well, what are you for a computer or because everybody's doing this, right? Which is exactly what we're doing. Generating more jobs, which is not really helping us forward. Yeah, thanks. Um, I have a question which might be a bit related to the previous one, well, but to go in the opposite direction, actually. Not about jobs, but rather um, about infrastructure, actually. Like, uh, you spent a big part of the talk talking about some rather low level stuff, virtual machines, engineers. Um, but nowadays, most of the things, not all, but most of the things are around the cloud, and the cloud has instructions which are way, way higher in uh, abstraction level, so to say, so like cloud run, Google Cloud, and so on. So I just wonder like, why most, not all, you know, most of uh, companies shouldn't just use those high-level abstractions and just get away, so get rid of the majority of the complexity that you have described. Because it's not a layer of complexity, and it's, you still need to configure those services. So if, Ten years ago, we were writing Chef and Puppet. 
Now we're writing software to do exactly the same. Can you use software for that, right? You click around them? Mm. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> so how do you make it's sure that safe. those cloud services, whether they're containers, whether they're load balancers, whether they're compute resources, how do you make sure that you can take one stack and spin up another which looks exactly the same? You write Gloomy, you write Tofu, you write some kind of code, CloudFormation, or whatever the proprietary vendors have. You write that kind of code, and that's what these patterns are about. Does that make sense? Or do we go to the EC2 console and you start create service, create load balancer, create security group, create, and you click around? You write the code to define those security groups. You write the code to define those S3 bytes. Well, my point is that a lot of the complexity just goes away when you just use algebra. Let's say you don't have a lot of balancer, right? You don't have a virtual machine. You can have your container in the register. Yeah, and you might use some automation to you know, create a config around which container to pull at which time, but that's really it. And you know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit it's much less complexity to think about, and many, many of these patterns they don't stay relevant in the world. That's you know, just my thoughts. I don't know what the cloud run is, but is that an open source tool, or is that? I know it's Google proprietary. Oh, it's Google proprietary. Okay, that's why I know it. Their proprietary roles don't exist to me. <laughs> and it hasn't for the past 20 years. Thanks. Sorry, I thought it was an open source conference. Do we have any more questions? I see one more hand. A bit later, we're to the last question then. Um, if instead of using other people's cloudy proprietary disk services, such as uh, the, the cloud, so-called cloud services you mentioned, if you run your own computers, does a lot of this complexity go away? If you run your own computers, you won't be able to, from bare metal up, all the way, well, if it's your own computer, or if it's somebody else's computer, it doesn't matter. There's more work to be done with your own computers, because if it's somebody else's computer, they give you already parts to talk to. If you need to build up OpenStack from scratch, you can start to open, talk, sorry, you can talk to the OpenStack API once it's there, but you still need to get it there. And cloud gives you already a couple of jump starts. It moves problems to other people. It's other people's computers. But you still can take the same patterns all over. You just have to manage more and more components. So if you want servers on top of container stack, on top of open stack, on top of bare metal, you need to manage all of those layers. If you only want to manage the top layer, you go to a cloud provider and say, hey, I need to just configure these. And that's where your choice is. And then there's the thing about open standards and open source being really related, and you want probably as an open source enthusiast to be able to move around from cloud provider to cloud provider to cloud provider which open source is going to give you and proprietary growth is not going to give you. And with that, I think we have to thank Chris for running off. <laughs>